Hey, this is Eric Freeman with Head First JavaScript Programming, and welcome to the insider's view of Chapter 5. Now, Chapter 5 is where things start to get very interesting, and they get interesting because we're really crossing that boundary between knowing a few things about the JavaScript language and knowing how to be a scripter and actually doing some real programming. And the reason Chapter 5 in particular gets us into that territory is because it starts to get into the topic of objects. Now, one thing to know about objects is they are a very deep topic. In fact, Elizabeth and I have written an entire 600 plus page book called Head First Design Patterns, which is nothing but about high level object oriented design. And so once you get yourself through everything about JavaScript objects and how to use them and some of the design philosophies behind them, you can take a look at that book to really study how to do your high level object design. And quite honestly, it's one of these topics that you can spend the rest of your life learning. So it's one thing that you will be learning continually as you develop more and more code. Now, more specifically about this chapter, the first thing we tackle in this is really the question of what is an object? And the surprising thing is that different languages you encounter will have different answers to that question. Now, JavaScript has a very simple answer, at least on the surface to that question, and that is an object is really just a set of properties that you collect together. And a property is just some kind of name and some kind of value. So for instance, we use a written example throughout the book of cars and every car, for instance, has a property which is a make, which might have a value like Chevy or Ford or Porsche or Tesla or whatever. Now, the first thing we have to get out of the way is really just the basic syntax of creating an object in JavaScript. And so we spend some time doing that. It's fairly straightforward. And actually, once you make your way through the exercises, you will almost be able for free to create objects in JavaScript. It's really just a simple syntax. And then we have you go off and create some of your own just for good practice. Now, be careful along the way. Don't get a speeding ticket from Web the Webville police. Make sure you've got your object syntax done. After we've done that, if we've gotten the basics of how to create an object out of the way, we spend just a tad bit of time on what does object oriented mean anyway? And we don't focus a whole lot on this deep topic in this chapter, but we just really get across the idea that object-oriented program is really about starting to program by thinking about your problem as a set of objects. And so let's say you want to create a traffic simulation program. Well, you want to worry about cars and stoplights and roads and those sorts of things. You don't want to be thinking about numbers and billions and strings and all of that. So it's really elevating how you think about a problem and think of it as a set of objects. Now, then we spend some time on the mechanics of properties within objects. How do they work? How do I get access to a property? How do I change one? How do I compute with them? How do I even delete a property if I have one? And then we go on to a topic which is a bit of a nitty gritty piece of detail about how JavaScript works and it involves the relationship between a variable and an object. Now, you know that a variable is like a container. So if I've got a number, if I've got a string, if I've got a Boolean, we know the variable which is assigned to that just is like a cup. It holds on to that value. Objects work differently. Think of it this way. If you've got a big object, you probably can't cram it into a little cup. But what you can put in it is a little reference to that object. And you can think of this reference as some kind of number or some kind of pointer or something that identifies that object. And anytime you use the variable, that reference is used to look up the object. Now, this has some ramifications. And it has ramifications when we do things like pass objects to functions. And this involves, if you remember, we talked about call by value, where if we pass a variable to a function, we take the value in it and we make a copy of it and we pass that to the function. So if we change that value in the function, it doesn't really affect the original variable. With objects, it's different. We're passing a reference. And so we're passing essentially a reference to the same object. So if we change something in the object, we have changed the original object because all references are the same, whether or not it's a copy. Now, that's one of those things that you want to read through this, go sleep on it, come back, look at it again, and make sure it sinks in before you move on in this chapter. It's not an incredibly hard concept, but it's just one you want to wrap your head around. Now, we've got lots of 
examples and lots of exercises in this chapter. And that's really to enforce a lot of these early concepts with objects that you're going to need to use later. Now, there's one other aspect of objects too that we talk about in this chapter, and that is one of behavior. So one way you can think about objects is think of the properties in the object as state. If I have a car, I might have a property which is mileage, and that really holds the state of the automobile. How many miles has it been driven? And I can update that value, I can read that value and make use of it. Might make a car buying decision based on that value. We can also add behavior to objects because objects just don't sit there. A car, for instance, could be driven, could be parked, could, we could apply the brake, we could kick on the turbo thruster, whatever. They have behavior. And so we spent some time talking about how to add behavior to an object. And by the way, all behavior in an object is, is a function. Now there's a bit of nomenclature you should know about. If we have a function within an object, we don't call it a function anymore. We get fancy. We call it a method. And that's something you're gonna see used independent of the language that you're using. But there's also this relationship between the behavior in your program and the state of your program. And we spend a little time on that in this chapter. Now there's one other nitty gritty detail that we go through in this chapter, and that is a keyword called this. And what this does is if I've got some code and that code is running within a function that we'll assume is in an object, I can always count on the this keyword to tell me which object I'm in. Now, the use of this is going to become a little more obvious as you move on in your use of objects. But it's important right now that you kind of understand the semantics of how this works. This in particular is one of those ideas where you need to read through this material, go sleep on it, come back, read it again, and keep doing that until you almost have muscle memory around the use of the this keyword. Again, it's going to take a little more experience and use with objects to truly get this and how it's used. But it's a concept we're going to get out of the way early so that when we move on in our use of objects, we'll have it right there to make use of it. And it's a pretty important concept. Now, finally, as the last bit of code in this chapter, we really do explore a little bit more of this uh, synergy between the state of an object and the behavior. And we do that by adding gasoline or fuel, rather, to our cars. And we see how that affects the various behaviors of the car once we do that. And then finally, we point out that you're probably going to encounter a lot more objects in your JavaScript world that are essentially out there to be used. For instance, there's objects that come with JavaScript as part of the, the core language. And there are objects that come, for instance, with the browser environment. And we usually make heavy use of these things in writing applications with JavaScript code. So we point those out. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time in the rest of the book going through some of those. Now, we also end uh, with an interview with an object. And this text is a bit forward looking, so make sure you read through that and really get a preview of what's coming up. And then we end it with two whodunits. The first is another Sherlock whodunit, and be sure to read that and see if you can figure out why this code uh, obviously is ripping off people and how Sherlock knows not only that, but how to catch them. And then finally, there is a crack the code challenge. Dr. Evil is back. We have managed to get a little bit of his JavaScript code off his internal website that happens to contain his passcodes and see if you can help us break the passcode. Now, the reason you particularly want to spend time on this is because it's a bit of a cliffhanger and it starts the beginning of the next chapter going into how to crack this. So it's particularly important not just for ending this chapter, but for starting the next. And that really wraps up the object chapter. Now, again, this is a very basic chapter in terms of getting us started with objects. We've got a lot more to do with objects as this book progresses.